respond when we like the preaching. And you know what? Most preachers would have left well enough alone. Especially in this day and time. Because most of these preachers preach to be liked. They need to be shot. Bang! They won't tackle issues that are tough. They won't say things that need to be saved. They skirt issues. They preach in a manner where the folk will enjoy them and get out, say it fast and head for the side door and everybody leave uh, saying, I enjoyed you. They didn't change, but they enjoyed it. But Jesus was not that way. He decided to take a turn that will <laughs> cause them to end up like they were in verse 28 and 29, full of wrath, and would try to kill him. Now, you got to wonder, how in one sermon did they go from amazement to let's kill that <laughs> Negro? What did he do? He did what any good preacher would do. He dealt with their sin. He knew while they were smiling, saying, great job, that there was wickedness just below the surface. Well, I know that. Sometimes when you're preaching, I said to myself, well, Lord, they're getting with me right now because I know they don't know where I'm headed. So I'm going to enjoy my amens while I can get them because when I say this, they're going to shut down. And it never fails. And I, I know I can feel people around me. I hear folks saying, well, do you have to say that or why don't you just leave it alone? Prophetess Floyd told me that she was giving advice, and I know that she was because I know who said it, and I know others that uh, this person said it to, and they did what the person said and got the results that the person said they would get. She didn't do it and got the results that she's getting. Someone said to her, stop all that preaching against sin. Stop that prophesying and Leave them homosexuals and all them folk, that adultery and fornication. Leave that stuff alone. And more doors will open for you. I told so-and-so the same thing, and she's following, and, 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 and the person, doors are opening everywhere. They just love her to death. But she doesn't preach about things that matter. She doesn't challenge the people you just make everybody feel good. The prediction of the advice uh, of the person who gave the advice says, if you follow this advice, doors will open. But if you don't, doors will close. Guess what? Doors did close. Prophetess didn't follow the advice and doors closed. Other person followed the advice and doors opened. But I wonder what's going to happen when we all stand before the Lord. Wonder, I wonder. I wonder who will have blood on their hands and who won't. I wonder who is the most effective representative of the gospel. Those who would dare tell the truth regardless to color, regardless to whether or not history is or isn't being made, regardless to whether or not somebody may leave or go. Who is God's man? Jesus 
could have, are you praying for me? Jesus could have wrapped it up, but not him. No, no, mm -mm, no, no. I mean, he takes such a drastic turn that I could tell that you couldn't tell how these scriptures fit. That's why I said I'll explain it in a minute. Because he go, after they just love him and say, how in the world does Joseph's son preach like this? He's a carpenter's son. How in the world does he say such powerful things? Then our Lord, I mean, it's like out the blue. He says, you will surely say this proverb. Physician, heal thyself. And whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do ye also in thy country. Jesus said, you're going to say this about me. Physician, heal your own people. And all those miracles that you are working up there in Capernaum amongst them Gentiles, you need to come and work these miracles down here amongst your own people. He said, you're going to say that. You're going to say this because you're going to hear about me healing Gentiles. Preaching to Gentiles. As a matter of fact, according to Matthew's gospel, Jesus had just recently switched his headquarters to Capernaum. The land of the Gentiles. So here is this young, dynamic rabbi in the first year of his earthly ministry shaking up everything because the Jews had great disdain for the Gentiles. They felt that the Gentiles, and Gentiles, by the way, are, are all human beings other than Jews, it includes me and you. They felt that the Gentiles were wood for the fires of hell. So they thought nothing of the Gentiles. And here is this young rabbi saying, I'm going to work such miracles amongst the Gentiles that you're going to ask me to come and work these kinds of miracles amongst you. And then he anticipates their response. And he says, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own home country. What does he say here? No, I'm not going to move from Capernaum. Because you all won't respect me. See, the miracles that I can work in Capernaum, I can't work amongst you. Because with you, you've allowed familiarity. Uh, to cause uh, contempt. And you don't see me like they see me. See, so the miracles that you want from them, you won't get because you don't see me the way that they do. I don't believe, Mother Turner, that God could have done through me in Rockingham what God did has done through me in Rock. Because in Rockingham, I'm doll baby's boy. In Rockingham, I'm Minister Pat, who grew up in the little Philadelphia section. In Rockingham, they won't see, praise the Lord, quite possibly the man of God. They see the boy from Philadelphia. You don't hear me. See? You, you, you got to be careful how you see God's man. That determines what miracles you can and cannot get. Jesus said, no, I'm not moving, and I'm going to work miracles in Capernaum. Why did he bring, why did he do this? Do this? He knew that when they were cheering him on, racism was in their heart. He knew why they were cheering him on and finding his words to be loquacious, that uh, arrogance was in their heart. He knew that while they were cheering him on, they had pride in their heart. 
And he loved them enough to go there to cause those things to surface. Because if we don't bring people face to face with their sinfulness, people won't repent. You didn't get saved until the gospel offended you. It doesn't work until the preacher get on your nerve. The entertainer is uh, Mr. Bojangles. He makes you feel good, but he doesn't convict your heart. And there are people when they get convicted, they say, I'm not going back to that church no more because I felt something. Well, they're not ready to change, and they, they're going to they're gonna gamble with their souls. But, but you ought to feel something. Praise the Lord. I see people when they get uncomfortable at times and walk out. Uh, I understand it. I'm anointed. And depending on what you want to do with your sin, that determines your reaction and your response to the truth. If you want to hold to your sins, then you'll reject the preacher. You're actually rejecting God and you'll walk out. You walk out when the word pops you. You get on the phone and call friends and loved ones and try to discredit what was said all because you know you're guilty. You know you're wrong. You know God found you. And instead of being glad that you found, you're getting mad. And all of a sudden, the, the, con the, the conversation is, I wonder how much did he pay for that suit? Honey, child, did you see the car? Praise the Lord. Service was too long. I don't agree with that. No, 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 no. All that is what you say when the word has found you and calls your wickedness to come to the surface. But you ought to be glad because I'm telling you, none of us get saved until we come face to face with our spiritual bankruptcy, till we come face to face with the fact that we are irrecoverably lost without the blood of Jesus. And preachers, we've got to make sure. I mean, I want to amen every now and again. I want you with me, but not at the expense of your soul. God knows what to say to bring this stuff to the surface. While Jesus was talking about preaching the gospel to the poor, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, and, and giving sight to the blind and all that stuff, them people were saying, praise the Lord. Oh, oh we've never heard anything like this. Oh, what great thing. How in the world did Joseph's son get like that? My God, Joseph's son is amazing. Then they thought, they thought, that he said something positive about the Gentiles. He couldn't have meant that. Oh, no. Like you've done. No, he didn't say something about Obama. No, he didn't. No, he, I, what? You know how you do. It's preaching until you don't like it. It's the truth until it offends you. You should have known I was headed somewhere. I started slow. You see how I pause? As I was reading some of y'all, looked up and thought I lost my place. I'm headed somewhere. Walking up. Praise the Lord, the King's Highway. Jesus didn't let them leave feeling good in their sin. And then when, when he challenged them on their wickedness, Notice this about our Lord. Our Lord doesn't take it back. See, this is one thing. You know, I'm so sick and tired of these mea copas and folk walking stuff back. And, you know, we're in a society now, especially the righteous. The righteous now are afraid. See, because now the wicked, they have learned something. Protest, 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 protest. Protest, 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 protest. Protest this, protest that. Protest the other. 
We're protesting crazy stuff. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution whatsoever that extends to refugees or foreigners. That no one has a right to enter into our country, just like nobody has a right to enter into your house except who you say can come into your house. We hear stupid stuff today. Well, I don't believe in walls. Well, first of all, a wall is not a religion. What do you mean you don't believe in walls? How stupid, what a stupid statement. You do believe in walls. Let me follow you home. Whether you live in a house, a trailer, an apartment, a townhouse, or whatever, there are walls. What's wrong with you? And the devil is trying to make you afraid. I don't want to say anything. No, 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 no. We need to say something. The Bible said, cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob, their sin. Show them. Show them. Let them call you what they want. The bigots call people bigots. A bigot is a person who, who refuses to listen to the opinions of others. Well, now, if you dare have a differing opinion, they shout you down. They're the bigots. The most in, the mo, those who cry tolerance are the most intolerant. Ain't nobody no more intolerant than homosexuals, lesbians, transgender, and all them. They're the most intolerant people of them all. They'll try to shout you down. Patrick, what can't be shouted down? For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Jesus, my Savior, did not walk it back. Jesus doubled down. He said, if what I've said to you so far makes you angry. He said, let me tell you a truth. Oh, this young rabbi with a spine. It's, isn't it wonderful to run into folk who, is, who still have a spine? It's fashionable today to be spineless. Oh, my. And to be weak, it's time to man up. It's time to get strong here. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, wait a minute. Let me, let me talk to you. And they're looking at Jesus. Uh, I feel like flying away. And Jesus said, there were many widows. Let me talk to you. Many widows, first of all, in Israel. He talk, he's talking to Jews now. Many widows in Israel, knowing that he's talking to people who know their history. Many widows in Israel. Are you with me? In the days of Elijah. All right? Widows. People. Israel. Location. Days of Elijah. So he goes back here, some... 800 plus years, about 870. And so there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. And, and let me tell you, I, and let me narrow it down more, a little more for you. When there was a famine. And it lasted three years and six months. See, because I don't want you to get confused. I want to bring it down to where you will know exactly where and when. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm talking about. And he said to them, of all of those widows in Israel, in the days of Elijah, during the famine that lasted three years and six months, God didn't send your hero, Elijah, to any of them. He didn't pick any of them. But instead, he sent him to the Gentile territory. He says, he says, just in case you think I'm saying something favorable about the Gentiles, let me tell you something else favorable. God chose 
the Gentile territory to sustain one of your great heroes. It was early one morning. You can find this in 1 Kings chapter 17. Ahab was king and he had married the daughter of Ephbel. He was a king of the Zidonians. Ephbel's daughter name was Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked woman and Ahab was a spineless king. I don't even know how he stood up. A man without a spine. To, when he wanted Naboth's vineyard, he went crying to his wife. Well, he was wicked and he, he built altars to false gods in the house of God. And then he turned around and worshipped the god Asherah, a female deity. All the priests of Asherah were punks. They were effeminate homosexuals who would hide behind the bushes and have sex with each other. That's the way they worship the God Asherah. I'm preaching now. Well, Elijah was in his court and one day he'd heard about it. Uh, Ahab was in his court. But he heard about Elijah, but they, they never had a face-to-face -face meeting. One day Elijah walked in uninvited and said to King Ahab, I am Elijah the Tishbite. I come from a land, uh, the land of Tishbe in Gilead near on the east side of the Jordan. I'm God's man and I come to tell you Ahab that as the Lord live and my soul live. There shall not be dew nor rain, good God Almighty, until I say it again. For the next three years, there won't be any rain. And, and the thing about what Elijah said was, God sent him in there during the rainy season. It was a time when the heavens were to give rain. See, if you're in a drought and you prophesy a drought, you're not saying anything. But if you're in a drought and you prophesy rain, now you're saying something. And if you're in a rainy season and you say it's going to rain more, you haven't said much. But if you're in a rainy season and say it won't rain again for the next three years and then it stopped raining, that means that God's hand is on you. So Elijah walked in uninvited, which to go before the, to come before the king uninvited could cost you your life. But he walks in and said it won't rain. Hallelujah, no dew nor rain. Uh, these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came upon him saying, after he prophesied, God said, get out of town. Go somewhere and hide from him. And he said that it wasn't going to rain. And he said, Yahweh said that it won't rain. Now, what am I working on now? You see, the Canaanites believed that Baal controlled the weather. The Canaanites believed that Baal controlled the rain. Elijah stepped in and said, it's not Baal, but it's Yahweh. Good God Almighty. How many know that the God of the Bible is the only God that there is? And he has power. Power! Oh Lord, if you know he's got power, let me see you wave your hand. Mm -hmm. He said, it's not going to rain. And then God gave a little dramatic irony. He tells the prophet to go somewhere and hide. And the prophet leaves and goes about 35 miles. And he hides where the king can't find him. And then God says, I have done something. He said, I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now here's the thing about the ravens. 
ravens, good God Almighty, are birds that are known for neglecting their own. Ravens are birds that are known for being afraid of people. Ravens are creatures that are dumb. And yet God says, I've commanded the ravens and the ravens are going to feed you twice a day. You go down by the brook Kennereth and go there to the brook that is near the Jordan and the ravens are going to feed you and I'm going to watch out for you. So Elijah is there and the ravens, they feed him twice a day. They bring him berries. They bring him food. They, they bring him meat. He eats twice a day and he drinks from the brook. But guess what happened? The brook dried up. And when the brook dried up, God came to him again and said, Oh, Elijah, I got a trip for you. He said, Arise and go down to Zarephath, to a town of the Zidonians. I want you to go into Jezebel's hometown. I want you to go there because I have commanded a widow woman to feed you there. Good God Almighty, the famine had stretched even there. The sun came up that morning and that widow woman, her husband was dead. She was poor. She had a son. Her food had run out. Everything had run out. Her meal barrel was all but empty. It looked like it was the worst day of her life. She had decided that she was going to pick up a couple of sticks and make a fire and feed her son and feed herself and that she was going to die. But how many know that when God chooses you, it can look like it's the worst day. But when the Lord lays his hand on you, the worst day can be the best day. Yeah! Ah! Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.